So, good evening. Um, welcome to the June 2020 uh, Plumtree meeting online. And tonight's meeting is on the foundations of astrophotography. Um, now, we're hoping over time we can um, pull together a, a number of online talks on a, a range of topics within astrophotography, uh, and tonight's being the first. Others including uh, planetary and lunar imaging, uh, a session on deep sky imaging, capturing data and processing, and then there's a, a number of miscellaneous things which filters and the like which we think belong or warrant being discussed so we're we're gonna at the moment call that everything else uh, so on to tonight's session um we're going to talk about managing expectations um ways to capture images of the of the sky uh, what to image a very brief um part on mounts uh, i think i suspect we need a whole session on mounts to um describe the various types but We'll just touch on those and then um, something about cameras which Lee's going to cover. So managing expectations, um, you have to remember also about managing expectations is what, what you're expecting from these talks. These really are just to whet the appetite for people who are uh, relatively new to astronomy or astrophotography. They're, they're pretty basic, um, probably skim over a lot of um, detail um, but we hope it it does whet the appetite and makes you realize you can do stuff without being an expert or having um, re really expensive kit a lot can be done now the other thing with managing expectations is um, being aware that the images you produce are unlikely to be as um, detailed and as colorful and as precise as the ones you see in magazines and on websites, um, which are taken by people who spend the majority of their life doing this and they have very expensive kits. Um, but you never know, um, you might become the next um, photographer, astrophotographer of the year. So here we've got um, two images that I've taken. Um, the top left is the Dumbbell Nebula, Messier 27. Uh, this is a lovely little planetary nebula. Uh, and I took that with this scope here. It's a, a Skywatcher 127 Maxitov on a single arm out azimuth mount. Um, and that was one of the first images I took um, with a, my Canon 6D. Well, that could have been with my 600D, I can't remember. Uh, and the other image, top right, is um, Jupiter, believe it or not. You can just make out, um, it's got a, a creamy hue and there's some subtle bands going across the planet. I haven't rotated this, so the bands are in the wrong orientation. Uh, and again, that was taken with this Skywatcher um, scope. But if we look at images of the same targets, which others have taken, um, this image here below uh, of the Dumbbell Nebula is a spectacular image by Steve Maslin. Um, all the images I've taken, I've used here, I've got express permission from the uh, owners to use them. Um, a, an amazing image of the Dumbbell Nebula here. Many hours of data uh, with different filters. Uh, and this actually was one of the astro um, photography pictures of the day um, back at the end of 2019 um, and you could just see the difference between Steve's image and mine um, I was over the moon at the time with my image that I'd actually captured something um, but Steve's is just on a, a, a total another level and then here we've got of course Damien Peach um, a spectacular image of Jupiter um, in unbelievable detail. You really would think this is a, a spacecraft uh, orbiting the planet taking this, but this is what Damien achieves from um, ground-based telescopes. Um, again, I'm not sure if this is with the Chili scope which he uses or one of his um, with his 
uh, C14. So the top ones are my images, the bottom ones are the professionals, let's call them images, um, and you can see the difference. So there are lots of different ways to capture images of the sky. Um, you don't necessarily need, need a telescope, so you can do it without a telescope, um, or more commonly with a telescope. And we're not going to talk about the different types of telescope you can perform astrophotography with, and that'll all come later in the other in the subsequent talks. So without a telescope, um, you can just get a static tripod, a, a conventional camera tripod, and put a, a DSLR or whatever camera you've got on top of this tripod, uh, hold it nice and still, and take some um, long exposures, 20 seconds, um, maybe lots of 20 seconds, and put them together in some free software. You can make star trails. Um, if you've got a very dark sky and a sensitive camera, you could get the, uh, the Milky Way. Um, so there's lots of, and you can also take images of the various um, atmospheric uh, phenomena which happen around the Earth, and we'll see some of those pictures later. So you can do lots of things with just a static tripod um, with a camera and lens on the top. And some more modern um, tripods, they allow you to track as well, uh, but they're a, a bit more expensive. And then when then we move on to imaging with a, a telescope. Uh, and the first way to image with a telescope is something called afocal imaging. So you have the telescope and you put an eyepiece in the telescope. Um, you focus on the target you're interested in. Uh, and then you hold a camera. And here we've got a, a smartphone held in uh, at this adapter called an XYZ. Uh, and you can move the smartphone around so um, the image projected from the eyepiece hits the sensor of the camera and then you can take video or stills um, with software on the camera. And there's quite uh, advanced software now on smartphones which um, allow you to alter the settings, sensitivity, brightness, exposure time, ISO effectively, um, and undertake time lapse. Uh, and if you don't have a smartphone you can um, use a DSLR. It's a bit more tricky to hold the camera and the lens against the eyepiece, but it is possible. So afocal imaging um, isn't popular with DSLRs, but with smartphones, it, it's a, a very good way to get basic images of the moon, um, the planets, brighter um, deep sky targets. Now the next way again is to have your telescope and an eyepiece um, and attach a, a camera without its lens directly to the eyepiece and we call this eyepiece projection. So the light coming through the telescope and the eyepiece is transmitted directly from the eyepiece to the sensor of the camera. There's no lens, there's no camera lens between the camera and the eyepiece. Um, now you need specific adapters to um, fit cameras to eyepieces. These uh, Beta Hyperion eyepieces come with an adapter and you can screw them directly to um, specific DSLR cameras, um, but not all eyepieces will do this. So you need to do a, a bit of research. And this can produce some relatively nice results, again, of um, brighter targets, the moon, the planets, um, and brighter deep sky objects. Um, but it isn't a common way to um, capture images. The commonest way is with um, a technique called prime focus. And this is where the telescope does not have an eyepiece um, and the camera does not have a lens. Um, and in effect, the telescope becomes the lens of the camera and you put adapters into the DSLR and then slot um, this uh, nose piece, it's called, into the focus tube of the telescope and then uh, looking through the camera you achieve focus and then you can take your video or still images. Um, and I've made a short video of um, the kit you would uh, use to 
perform uh, prime focus. So there you've got a, a T2 adapter ring and that is specific for cannons. And that piece in my right hand is a two inch nose piece which screws in to the adapter ring. And the, adapt the nose piece is threaded so you can add filters. Then it's a case of taking the lens off the uh, DSLR camera uh, and that reveals the mirror. You can see the mirror, it's uh, a camera with a mirror. And then this uh, T adapter just clips into the camera and then uh, the nose piece would slot into the telescope and that that's you at prime focus. So uh, now moving on to uh, what to image. Um, we've looked at the different potential ways. So there are things uh, related to the Earth's atmosphere which are very um, pretty and uh, interesting to image. There's things uh, in our own solar system uh, and then there's things outside our solar system. And that's just my simplistic classification of um, the sorts of targets. So if we look at, I'm going to turn my picture off. If we look at uh, the atmosphere, first of all, uh, again, I've got permission to use these images. Here you can see uh, Aurora. This is from Denis Brzezinski in uh, Scotland. Um, you've got the foreground here and then you've got this amazing auroral display of green and red light and, the, and these pillars coming down or going up, whichever way you want. Um, and this can be achieved with a, a static tripod and a camera and uh, sort of several second exposure image so you don't get too much star trailing. Um, here in the middle we've got a picture from Martin Crow um, of a um, iridescent cloud feature. So this is a daytime image and you can see this rainbow like effect in the cloud uh, caused by uh, sunlight um, refracting off the um, constituents of the cloud. And then on the right, we've got a wide field shot and this streak of light here is a Geminid meteor. Um, and you can just see the belt of Orion here. And so Gemini will be up here somewhere and this, this meteor has originated from Gemini and is streaking towards the horizon. And again, this image can be done with a DSLR camera um, reasonably long exposure to try and capture something from a dark site. And then at the bottom, two images of mine. Um, we've got here this electric blue noctilucent cloud. We're currently in noctilucent cloud season and they've been seen quite widely. So um, keep an eye out for those. Very high um, cloud, which is illuminated from underneath by the sun, which is below the horizon down here. Um, very pretty, but very subtle. And again, easily picked up with a static tripod and a camera. And here we've got a moon halo. So um, I don't know what phase this moon's at, but um, you, sometimes if the uh, moisture in the air is correct, uh, you get this halo um, forming around the moon. And they also form around the sun and you get sun dogs and things. Um, very easy to um, image. Just be careful with the sun as always. So we'll move on now to the solar system. Um, here we've got a lovely picture of a comet by Martin Mobley using um, a remote telescope. You can see the, the coma and the tail. Um, and this um, will probably be a series of images stacked um, or one long exposure. I'm not, not sure of the settings for that. I should have checked. Um, and I will before the questions. Um, and here is a total eclipse by Nick James. So the, the dark uh, ring here is the moon and the sun is behind. And you can see all these um, prominent lines coming out uh, during a totality. Down here we've got uh, Richard, our own Richard's uh, image of the moon. Um, taken with it through a telescope, uh, again with a DSLR camera, 
and you can see the terminator uh, which is the line which marks the, the uh, day and night on the moon if you're on the moon surface um, and you can see some lovely features along the terminator mare imbrium there um, mare chrysium there uh, and that's the, the the sea of tranquility and apollo 11 are landed somewhere about down there and then here we've got Gareth's brilliant montage of um, the rest of the solar system. Um, he didn't take the picture like this, but he, he, he's taken the individual components and, and lined them up in this montage. So here we've got the lovely picture of the sun with a sunspot. And then we've got Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and he even managed to get Pluto. And I keep meaning to ask, in what these are, whether they are um, asteroids. And then top right, um, we've got a, a, a short animation by Philip Masding um, of the International Space Station, which he took um, as it flew overhead. And he's got um, special tracking software, uh, which he can track the space station at, at, as it flies across the sky at breakneck speed um, and he captures images and then can um, put those images together and get this amazing um, detailed animation of the of the ISS flying past and that flash of light is just as um, sunlight is reflected off part of the the uh, body of this of the space station so all these images are taken with um, a, uh, a telescope and a camera attached uh, but they're all things within our solar system now we move outside the solar system so these are uh, what we would call deep deep sky objects or deep space objects and again most of these are taken with a telescope and a camera and top left we can see a lovely um, globular cluster by Nix Manick um, and you can see it's populated by um, predominantly old red stars these bluer stars are probably not related to the cluster and maybe in the foreground but one of our um, astrophysics experts would be better talking about that. Uh, here we've got an, an amazing picture of the um, M51 uh, galaxy. Um, two galaxies, one is stripping uh, matter from the smaller one um, and you can see these red patches are hydrogen alpha rich regions, which are uh, uh, star forming regions. And on the right, uh, Marcus McAdams, a, a, a photographer, and he's allowed me to use this wonderful image of the Milky Way he took in uh, Italy, I believe, above the cloud layer. Uh, and the, the, the illumination of the clouds from below is from um, effectively light pollution from towns and villages and I think it gives that that gives an, an amazing effect of the, um, the stars of the Milky Way and that's looking into the center of the Milky Way. Here we've got another picture by Gareth um, of the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, lovely uh, image of um, the members of the Pleiades and the nebulosity they're associated with or passing through and they illuminate this cloud and dust. Here's one of mine of the ring nebula, um, so a planetary nebula again like the dumbbell nebula and there's a, a star at the center of it, uh, a white dwarf which is where all this matter, um, gas and dust has emanated from. And then finally on this page uh, we've got a, a, a gorgeous picture of um, the horsehead nebula by Lee. Uh, you can make out um, the horse there. Uh, always think it looks more like a seahorse than a conventional horse. And then all this um, gas and dust um, in the vicinity. So these are um, images which are harder to obtain um, than the solar sister image, images. They generally require longer exposures, um, but amateurs like all of us can still um, get great results in, the, in this area. 
Now, the other thing to touch on are mounts. So, um, mentioned um, that a camera can sit on a static tripod. Um, so the tripod is really the legs and then the mount is the part which sits on top of the tripod and holds uh, either the camera or the telescope. And as I said at the start, this is a whole separate topic and we're just going to touch on the basics here. Um, here we've got uh, just reinforcing what you can do with a static tripod. Um, just put a camera on top and you could take uh, landscapes and images of uh, what happens in the atmosphere and you can get some really lovely results with that. The next type of mount is something called an alt azimuth mount, uh, altitude and azimuth. So you can see here, uh, here's the tripod and then the mount is really this part. And this type of mount rotates around, we've got an animation coming up, yeah. <clears throat> uh, rotates around um, the horizon and we call that in azimuth uh, and it can go up and down and we call that altitude. So with this type of mount you can go look at any part of the sky um, and it's, it's, you can have motorized versions um, and it's useful for imaging things in the solar system. Um, less useful for imaging things outside the solar system and we're not going to discuss why at the moment. This is a Dobsonian mount. Um, it was named after John Dobson who invented it um, and here we've got a large, largish Newtonian or reflecting telescope uh, and the mount is very basic. Um, his premise was he wanted to um, open up astronomy to um, the public so he wanted something that was portable, easy to set up um, and undertake his sidewalk astronomy with. And this mount can be made from um, plywood and, and basic hardware equipment. Uh, and the, the telescope is balanced in effect. And like the Altazimuth mount, it rotates in azimuth around this point uh, and you can tilt it up and down. So again, you can um, look at any part of the sky with this. You can get motorized versions and versions with GoTo, um, but because essentially it's an altazimuth mount, uh, not useful for, um, not greatly useful for imaging things outside the solar system. And that's where we need an equatorial mount. So again, here, here we've got the tripod and then the mount head or the mount part. And equatorial mounts commonly have um, weights and there are different types of equatorial mounts again we're not going to worry about those today but the the unique thing about equatorial mounts is this axis the right ascension axis it's called uh, is aligned with um, the north celestial pole so very near to the north star because that's where everything in the sky seems to rotate around um, day and night and if we have the, this mount aligned to that, we can track objects in the outside the solar system um, for much longer and get longer exposures. And um, that's really what you need for deep sky imaging. Right, uh, and there is um, my garden astro hedgehog, not an astrophotograph, but a photograph of an astro hedgehog. Uh, now we're gonna move on and discuss uh, some basics of cameras. So uh, now on to talk about the cameras. Some would argue that the camera is the most important um, component of an astrophotography setup. Others might say the telescope and others still might say the mount or um, any guiding kits you've got. But for the moment we're just going to talk about the basics of cameras. So this bit of the talk, we're going to look at digital versus film, um, talk about sensors, um, look at the differences between CMOS and CCD, uh, think about how to capture data um, with a, a digital camera, and then finally um, ask the question of what camera um, should people be using. So the first thing is to think about um, digital versus film. Uh, and digital today is now the predominant camera format. Um, 
anyone who's probably older than 30 will remember um, using film cameras and putting 35 mil millimeter canisters into a camera or even um, single use cameras which you'd take the film or the camera to the, the chemist and they process and a week later you'd get your films, your images. Um, but uh, digital cameras um, were developed in the mid 70s um, and became very popular uh, in the late 90s um, on a commercial basis. Um, film is still favoured by some um, professional photographers um, and professional astrophotographers. Um, and just as some people still listen to music on vinyl rather than CD, um, there are some people who favour um, film rather than digital imaging. But for the purpose of this talk, we're just going to um, concentrate on, on digital cameras. So this is a picture of the first digital <clears throat> camera, which was um, devised by Steve uh, Sasson uh, when he was working at the Eastman Kodak Company in the mid 70s. Um, and it had a 0.01 megapixel sensor. It was over three and a half kilograms. Um, and whilst the image it took uh, saved to a, a, a transient memory very quickly, it took about 23 seconds to record the image to um, a cassette tape. And you can see a cassette there on the right. Um, and tapes typically held um, between 24 and 36 images. So very similar to the um, number of images you would get from an old um, film canister. So why have we gone to digital? Well, I think that the, the biggest reason for this is the immediacy and the convenience. So um, someone who takes a picture can immediately look at that picture uh, see if it's any good or not, see if it's in focus, see what the lighting's like. And if it's not any good, take another one. Um, and it hasn't cost anything uh, other than the original setup costs of a camera. And it's now very easy to print your own images out at home um, with home printers. You don't need to rely on going to the a chemist or a, um, someone else to process your images. And also it's very easy to manipulate a digital image. There's lots of photo editing software uh, where you can remove unwanted artifacts um, and you can even, even stack images, which we'll, we'll mention later and in subsequent talks. But another more important <clears throat> consideration is that the digital cameras are much more sensitive to light. And we talk about uh, quantum efficiency or the QE and this is really the efficiency of a, a camera to convert photons, um, so packets of energy, packets of light, into a signal which we would uh, visualise as an image. And in the old days, film um, cameras were generally uh, regarded as having a 1-2% to 2 quantum efficiency, so 98% of the photons were not registered and not, um, would not take part in the final image. Some would argue that if you hypersensitized old films, you could get it to maybe 4%, but um, I don't know. My Canon 6D DSLR has got a, a quantum efficiency of 50%. So that's 50% of the light coming in is um, converted into signal. And then, as you can see, as you get... Um, as you get more advanced cameras, the quantum efficiency goes up. And interestingly, looking at um, one of the smartphones, the Galaxy S10, um, that's got a quantum efficiency of 60 to 80 percent, depending on the wavelength of light, and scientific sensors of up to 95 percent. So this is an image of um, a digital sensor. It just looks like a, 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 com a computer chip, um, and it's got an iridescent um, screen. And if you were to look at that iridescent screen under a microscope or with the magnifying glass, you'd see that it's made up of lots of little um, lines and, and blocks. And each one of those little squares is essentially a pixel, a light sensitive um, component. And I've drawn here a schematic of part of a sensor. So each one of these squares is um, the small square is a pixel. 
So that's one pixel, there's another pixel. And how we um, apply what uh, resolution a sensor is, is by, by counting how many pixels. So this one I've drawn has got eight pixels in a row, uh, 10, pix 10 columns of pixels. So if we multiply eight by 10, it's, it's 80 pixels. So this is an 80 pixel sensor, so pretty small. Um, so how sensors work, our photon comes in from wherever, whether it's a, a distant planet reflected off the sun or uh, if it's a nebula, and it hits one of these pixels and that pixel is a, um, an electronic uh, circuit which converts the photon into an electron which is received as a, which is the signal. And these electrons are, are stored effectively in a, in a bucket from each pixel. We call that an electron well. Um, and if you imagine um, the whole sensor, each pixel has got a bucket, bucket underneath which collects the electrons and then the electronic circuitry can uh, determine uh, which buckets are full and which have got nothing in and it can convert that data and make a, an image of light and dark areas. Now we've thought about the sensor size already so you can think about sensors in terms of the number of pixels. So um, we talk about 10 megapixel uh, sensors or cameras so multiply the rows and columns and you'll get the number of megapixels but you can also think about the physical size of the sensor and here we've got an example here of five millimeters by four millimeters and I've just again drawn a schematic of two sensors both the same size of five millimeters and four by four millimeters and as you can see the the sensor at the top has got um, eight by eight pixels so that's 64 pixel sensor and this sensor here has got four by four so 16 um, pixel sensor so the physical size of the sensor is the same but the number of pixels is different and consequently the size of the pixels is different so these are much bigger pixels than these little ones here um, and subsequently uh, we'll talk about the relevance of the size of pixels. So here's a picture of my Canon 6D. It's got a, a relatively large sensor you can see here, 36 by 24 millimeters, that's its physical size. And it's got 5,500 by 3,600 pixels. So that gives it a total of 20 million pixels. So that's a 20 megapixel sensor. And each of those pixels is about 6.4 uh, micrometers. And what I've done here, this red square, is um, just a representation of how big um, that sensor is. It's not real, real life, but it's, it's going to be used to show a comparison of another sensor in a moment. So that is effectively the size um, of this sensor. And if we were to put that camera on a, a telescope with a focal length of 500 millimeters, and point the telescope at the Andromeda galaxy, M31, um, this is the sort of image, the scale we would, we would get. So we've nearly fit the whole of the um, Andromeda galaxy in the frame. And ideally you'd rotate the, the camera so that the galaxy went um, in the horizontal plane here to, to fit more of it in. Now, Another camera I've got is the ASI ZW0120. Now this is a, a dedicated planetary camera and it's got a much smaller sensor. So 4.8 by 3.6 millimeters compared to 30 by 20 something for the, the Canon 6D. And here you can see also it's got fewer pixels um, and this is a 1.2 megapixel sensor and the pixels are smaller. 3.75 uh, micrometers compared to over 6 micrometers for the, the Canon 6D. And here again, I've the red shows the uh, relative size of the sensor of the Canon 6D. And here in blue is the relative size um, or proportionate size of the ASI ZW0120. And you can see the this camera's sensor is much, much smaller than the Canon 6D sensor. Um, 
And if we were to put this camera into the 500 millimeter focal length telescope and point at the Andromeda galaxy, this is what we'd end up seeing. And you wouldn't know necessarily that that is the Andromeda galaxy because we're only looking at a very small portion of that. And again here, um, with the red square in the top right, I've just highlighted the area that this camera is viewing in that same telescope. And if we can compare that to the uh, view of the 6D here, you can see a smaller sensor will give you a much smaller field of view um, for any given telescope and target. So it's important to think uh, about matching your telescope, your camera and your targets uh, in advance of uh, an imaging session so you, you know what your likely results are going to be. If I wanted to image the Andromeda galaxy, I would not use this camera because I would not um, detect any uh, of the outer spiral arms here. Uh, I would go for the 6D. But equally, if I was imaging something very small and bright, like a, um, like a planet, I would go with this um, ASI ZWO camera and not the 6D. So all sensors in the camera um, are monochromatic by default. Um, again, is a schematic of a sensor, uh, and they simply convert, each pixel simply converts photons into an electric signal. And that sensor doesn't care <clears throat> if the photons are uh, blue, red, or green, um, whatever their wavelength, it will convert them into uh, an electron. Now, many cameras we use are colour cameras, um, and underlying this is a um, a mono sensor, so again it, it just detects whether there's light or no light um, and how to make it colour is to put on top of um, the pixels something called the Bayer matrix um, named after the chap who um, came up with this idea. And here we can see the Bayer matrix superimposed on the mono sensor and it's effectively little filters coloured filters, green uh, and red and blue, which go over the um, pixels and what they in effect do is only let through light of certain wavelengths and wavelengths um, determines the colour. So here we can see the red filters um, will only allow through red photons, uh, green filters will only allow through green photons and blue filters will only allow blue photons through and the um, technology inside the camera can reassemble um, these different uh, signals and generate a, a color image. Um, if there was no Bayer matrix, it would just be a monochromatic image. Now, we can talk in the future about um, the benefits of uh, using a color camera versus a mono camera, um, but I don't think that's uh, needed tonight. So the next topic is um, CMOS versus CCD um, and to be honest um, there were there was a time uh, 10 years or more ago when they were very different. Um, uh, CCD were far superior um, than the CMOS sensors um, but CMOS has been developed a lot so there are now cooled, cooled uh, CMOS sensors um, and uh, they are, are becoming much more comparable. But this is a, 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 again another discussion for another day. I don't want to um, get into too much detail in this first talk. So we need to think about how to capture data and this is uh, astrophotography data and there are three main ways or at least I've, I've classified it into three main ways. So there's the single short exposure, um, there's fast frame rate video, and there's single long exposures. And we're going to look briefly at each of those three in turn. So uh, here we've got a single short exposure. This is from um, Shirley. Uh, she's put a, a smartphone against an eyepiece on a telescope looking at the moon. Uh, and taken a, a single image and you can see lovely um, at this, near the southern pole um, some lovely 
crater features um, and I've labelled them here uh, Naismith and Phocylides I had to look that up how to pronounce it and here we have another one um, this is Roy's image this is a third of a second using a smartphone again on an eyepiece on his Newtonian reflecting telescope uh, of the moon and here's the Terminator uh, and you can see some amazing detail um, and I've labelled some of these more prominent craters if you want to go away and look this is the Mare uh, Nectaris on the towards the eastern side of the moon in the eastern half uh, and a lovely horseshoe shaped crater here uh, which has subsequently been eroded and filled with lava so you can do a lot of things with single short exposures um, and hopefully these have shown that, that you can do that with smartphones. Now the next option is uh, using fast frame rate video. Now um, this is some data that I collected uh, of Jupiter a few years ago uh, using that ZWO120 camera um, and this is only filming at 30 frames per second so by modern standards that's not particularly fast. Uh, more modern cameras can achieve over 200 frames per second and you can see here with Jupiter it's wobbling around um, the seeing isn't great it's all a bit um, in and out of focus but what we can do with um, video footage is to run it through software and it breaks the video down into individual frames so this was two minutes worth of data at 30 frames per second so that's a lot of frames uh, and then software will sort through those individual frames pick out the best ones and then we can tell the software to stack which means placing them on top of each other um, and what that does is it helps to average out the seeing conditions and the focus and it allows you to pull out more more detail so you can see here a single exposure of Jupiter would look awful well it's not that bad it's got it's got bands and you can see the, the red spot um, but if you can stack multiple frames from that video you get a much crisper image uh, you can see much more detail on the on the belts and the red spot you can see there's a, um, a a central bright redder, redder peak in, in that. So rapid frame rate video is often used for solar system targets. And then the other thing to do is to undertake single exposures but long exposures. So here we've got some data from Roger Clark. He, he's allowed me to use this. Um, this is going to show the effect of increasing exposure time um, on, on your data acquisition. Um, so here we have a one second exposure of the Orion Nebula. Um, you can just make out it, I always think it looks a bit like a bat. So um, there's the bat's head and here are the bat's wings. Um, then what Roger's done is he's taken a 10 second exposure and I've tried to overlay these so they um, match and you can see just by doing 10 times um, the exposure time you get, you're picking up a lot more light and you're able to determine a lot more detail uh, in the target that you're looking at. Um, and then if we go to a 60 second exposure you can really see the difference now. There's, it's a lot brighter, a lot more photons have been detected, um, so there's a lot more detail. Um, and then uh, the advantage of digital images is you can stack these. And again, what Roger's done here is to stack 27 of these um, one 60 second exposures, and the image he gets is, is pretty spectacular. Um, you can see now all this um, dust and gas nebulosity around the, the central nebula itself. Um, so this is, if we go back, that's one second exposure. So that might be what 
something similar you might see with the naked eye with a, a biggish telescope um, and then here you've got 10 seconds 60 seconds and then effectively 27 minutes um, worth of data so the longer the exposures um, the more um, detail you'll be able to see so th the final sort of question is what camera should I use um, if you've already got a camera just use it all cameras can be used in some way in astronomy um, and if you're struggling just let uh, any of us know um, and we can try and help you work out how to use the camera you've already got but if you're looking to get a camera you need to work out what are you actually interested in photographing so if you're interested in uh, landscape uh, wide field um, astrophotography without a telescope so star trails then the obvious sort of camera would be a, a, a DSLR type camera um, if you're interested in taking uh, more detailed pictures of things in the solar system so planets the moon and potentially the Sun with appropriate filters then you uh, would be thinking more about a planetary camera so one of those cameras which does rapid frame rate video photography but you could also use a digital uh, SLR because they often have um, a video function although it's not as um, good for various reasons as a dedicated planetary camera or if you're interested in um, the deep sky objects nebula galaxies um, planetary nebula clusters uh, then you'd be thinking about doing much longer exposures and you'd be wanting something like a, a, a dedicated CCD uh, or a cooled modern CMOS camera but again uh, a DSLR is a, an excellent um, tool to get you into deep sky objects so the one thing I would say is if you're looking to get a camera um, and you're interested in all of that or you're not sure what you're interested in then the, the common feature here is a, a DSLR um, and I think a, a DSLR is an excellent introduction um, for someone to astrophotography We've thought we'd end this evening's meeting by previewing the lunar occultation of Venus, which, weather permitting, we should be able to see from Nottingham tomorrow morning. Before we start, just the usual health warning whenever viewing an event like this, the planet Venus and the Moon are located still quite close to the Sun, so they only reached uh, inferior conjunction just a few days ago. So they're only separated by 10 degrees uh, in the sky so great care is needed to view this event if you're using a telescope I think the recommendation is to get your telescope tracking on Venus in the pre-dawn sky before the sun rises and if you're going to use binoculars perhaps try and use something to shield the sun uh, out of a building so you can't stray your field of view anywhere near to the uh, disk of the sun as this evening's talk was on astrophotography, um, perhaps it would be quite nice for members to have a go at trying to image this event and we'd really be interested to see any of your images that you managed to capture. So before we start, just a quick look at lunar occultations of Venus and how frequent they are in their occurrence. So here we have the event tomorrow on Friday the 19th of June. So they actually occur fairly regularly, but these are visible anywhere on the Earth's surface. So we normally see one or two events each year visible somewhere from, on, from the surface of the Earth. But the actual frequency as seen from any one particular location is actually relatively infrequent. Um, the next actually visible from, from Nottingham is on the 9th of November 2023. So the next five occurrences we won't really be able to see. I think one of those is visible but quite low on the horizon so it won't be a very good opportunity to actually observe the occultation event. But the frequency of occurrence is, is even rarer when we look at what we call the nocturnal occultation of Venus. So that's when the occultation uh, occurs during twilight sky. So Obviously, Venus doesn't actually get very far separated from the sun uh, in the night sky. So the actual opportunities for 
a nocturnal occultation to occur actually quite limited and the next from visible from Nottingham is on the 10th of January 2032. So it will be, will be well worth trying to observe tomorrow morning's event. Let's have a quick look at what we're going to see. So this uh, sequence is taken from Stellarium. Um, I've actually put this into night mode. Obviously the sky will be a bright blue, um, but just for the purpose of the illustration here, um, you can see that the event starts um, at about 8.40 uh, in the morning and concludes just over an hour later, um, about 9.40ish, Venus starts to emerge from the other side of the moon. So the phase of the moon um, at the moment is just a 4% illuminated um, crescent and it's in its waning phase. In fact, I think we're moving towards a uh, new moon, I think on Sunday, when I think there's actually a annular um, solar eclipse visible, unfortunately not from our shores, but over Asia and Africa. Um, Venus is just 7% illuminated and it's down to just 51 arc seconds, but it'll still be quite bright, it'll be much brighter uh, than the moon appears in the sky. So I think actually trying to see the event get your telescope tracking on Venus and then watch the um, crescent moon drift into the field of view as Venus starts to approach it. So where to look? So this is again a view taken from Nottingham at 8.40 in the morning just at the start of the occultation and you can see there the sun in the pretty much east um, and then the moon and Venus will be about 45 degrees um, above the horizon, so quite uh, high up, but obviously very close, just 10 degrees separation from, from the sun. Then the all-important timings then, so the event, uh, as we from Nottingham, gets underway uh, about 8.40 uh, BST in the morning, and that's when the planet Venus starts to be occulted by uh, the limb of, of the moon, so the occultation event starts by the lit side of the moon um, starting to occult the planet Venus. And here's just a slightly more zoomed in shot showing you that uh, sort of first contact essentially uh, at 8.40. And then the occultation event takes just over an hour till the planet starts to emerge from the other side of the moon and this is be emerging on the night side of the moon, so the unilluminated side of the moon. Um, and that occurs about 9.44. Um, quite difficult, actually, to, well, impossible really to see the uh, emer first emergence of, of, of the planet because it's also on the night side um, of Venus. So it's not until about a minute later when the very first um, part of the crescent starts to emerge from behind the moon. Uh, and then quite quick, just a minute later, that. 9.46 and the whole crescent Venus should reappear and the occultation event is over. So there's a challenge for you um, to get up early tomorrow morning, get your telescope set up, start tracking Venus before the sun rises um, and then view the occultation event um, and hopefully if you've got your um, DSLR linked up to it, or even a CCD um, planetary camera. You can have a go at imaging um, the event. We'd really like to see some of those images, so do send those in to us. Thank you very much. Oh, <clears throat> right. <clears throat> Oh, Richard's on the case, um, getting the questions up. Now, Julian, I think he's going to post a link to a Zoom <clears throat> uh, meeting he's going to host later. Um, so after this, you can log into a Zoom call and uh, see and chat with other members. I'm going to have a slurp of tea. 
and John's just said, do mind the sun. Yes, if you are lucky enough to have a clear sky tomorrow and are hunting for Venus and the moon, um, just be very careful of pointing anything in the region of the sun. So that writing's very small, Richard. Can it go any bigger? But if not, don't worry, I'll squint. Um, I hope Shirley liked the fact I included her image. Um, it was a good image and demonstrated the purpose um, perfectly. Hopefully Lee and Richard are here as well. Yeah, there's Richard. Lee hasn't appeared. Yeah, there he is. Um, so... Andrew has asked, what about system mirrorless cameras versus DSLRs? Um, the honest answer is I don't know a lot about mirrorless cameras. Um, um, I can probably answer that one. Oh, OK. Um, probably better than DSLRs these days because they're lighter. So there's less strain on your mount or whatever you've got it attached to. Um, less flex on your telescope um, can go on really. Um, they're just smaller, but with the same sensors on board. So probably uh, at an advantage over DSLRs. Now the, the sensor's not the same distance away uh, from the camera body as a, a mirrored camera, is it? So you'd have to- uh, Typically, yeah. Spacing. Um, you might be slightly different, but usually they're, they're of a similar spacing because they use the same uh, lenses. And then what about the fact the um, LCD is always going to be powered on? Does that affect battery life? Um, probably would. Uh, it's probably worth trying to turn that off. But you've got nothing to look through? Uh, you, you, could, you should have it switched on to set up with. Right, OK. And then uh, power it off. Okay. Uh, once you've got going. So um, it doesn't sound like there's any drawbacks compared to a, a standard DSLR. Maybe only benefits of lighter. Um, that being the main benefit, I guess. So hopefully, Andrew, that's helped. Um, I guess a bridge camera is not much good because the, the lens is fixed to the body. Um, but a mirrorless camera, if you've got one that the lens comes off, then it should be just as good as uh, a DSLR. Have we got any other questions there? Give the number and password. No, I don't know what the number and password is. Oh, Julian's posting that. Um, Andrew said, the presentation, very interesting and thought provoking. Yeah, well, uh, the key is to have a go. Um, whatever kit you've got, you can probably do something. Um, and if you want to go further, then give us a shout. Uh, Herbal has asked, he was late. We won't, we'll let you off this time, Herbal. Um, what filters would you recommend for? mood and planet photography um mood right um soft lighting for mood um but if you meant moon and planet uh, it depends what camera you're using um if you're using a basic camera i wouldn't use any filters um you want to get as much light as possible um and if you use filters you you are not getting all the photons and your camera might not be sensitive to the photons which are getting through. Um, but if you tell us what sort of camera, um, we can have a think about that. But on the whole, I, I wouldn't bother with filters um, at the moment. If you've got a mono camera and you're looking for color images of planets, then you'll have to use um, RGB filters um for to to compose a color image um, but if you've got a color camera I, I wouldn't bother with filters um have you any experience of photography with binoculars no um uh, astronomy and astrophotography is hard enough 
without trying to photograph through a pair of binoculars, but I'm sure it can be done. Um, if binoculars are all you've got um, and you can get them on a mount and get them stable or get them to track something, then I'm sure you could rig up a system to um, take some uh, images through the eyepiece. Um, but I, I haven't had any experience with that. Lee, have you ever tried to take photos? Yes. Oh. It's hard. <laughs> okay. Right then. Um, we need the Zoom meeting ID from Julian. Julian, you have you are you on this? Julian uh, it seems to filter out the links, numbers, and all sorts. Richard, you want to copy it into a uh, notepad and put it on the screen? Yeah, I don't actually have a copy of it myself. Hold on. Bye. So while the this thing is going on, we'll carry on. Um, Herbal, sorry, Mint Moon. Yeah, we, I guessed you did. Um, have a Sony compact camera. So that'll be a, um, a color camera. So I, I wouldn't use any filters. Um, if the moon is too bright, then you're taking pictures of it at the wrong phase, probably. You, you'll be near full moon, mm. and that's not the best time. You could use a neutral density filter to. Uh... Yeah. Just try and limit the uh, if it's excessively bright. Um, yeah. But with the, if you're using a DSLR, you should be able to adjust the settings enough to compensate for that anyway. Yeah, you shouldn't really need a filter. Um, I mean, you could look at using a red filter to cut down on chromatic aberration, or if the seeing's really bad, um, that's that's something you could look at. Right. Um... There's more chat going on about the the subsequent meeting than the questions. Mm. Um, there's, a, there's a question about why there's more green filters than red or blue. I'm guessing you're talking about the Bayer matrix. Um, that's basically to emulate a human eye. Human eye is most sensitive to green light. So of the four pixels, two of them are dedicated to green, uh, which gives a rough approximation to uh, our eyesight. Um, there are other versions of that sort of matrix, aren't there, which use different mm. colors, um, yeah. but that's the commonest one, the used yeah. one. Uh, most uh, you know, terrestrial cameras would use that, that particular pattern. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a consideration if you're using a color camera with filters, so, if you were to use a red filter in a color camera, um, then you're only uh, using one in four of the pixels. So your resolution subsequently or uh, will be diminished. Um, that's why Astro laser pointers are green, Fred says. They also interact with the moisture in the atmosphere. Better. Yeah. Or so you get more scatter because they're right. closer to the, uh, the further end of the spectrum so you can see them easier. Right. So I've, um, Gareth, they weren't asteroids in Gareth's picture. They were um, uh, Galilean moons, Euro, Europa and Io. Uh, and the other thing I've written down is um, Martin Mobley's comet was a composite image of um, one minute exposures in RGB and two minutes in uh, luminance, so a five minute total exposure. And Richard's putting something online. Um, presumably you take raw pictures rather than JPEGs. Uh, it depends what you're imaging. Um, raw is always best um, because there's no compression and you get the, the data that you've originally captured. So yes, on the whole uh, raw, um, you get better contrast as well. A JPEG's only an eight, eight bit picture. Right. 
whereas uh, the, the raw image will take the, the full um, resolution of the camera. Right. That's when I say resolution, the, the full bit depth of the of the of each individual pixel. Um, DSLR is probably about ten or twelve. So you, there's a lot more color inf uh, contrast information that you'll get from a raw. And and the bit depth is the uh, function or how how many steps there are between black and white. Yes. So um, I'm trying to think what it is on a JPEG without looking it up. Um, it's probably a few thousand. That's the difference between a few thousand and, and many thousands. I think. Right. Um, I'll have to check. Richard, are you all good? Do you need anything else from Julian or? No, that link's now on, on the notepad. So if people want to join that, that's the details they should need. Hopefully that'll keep Fred happy now. Um, what else? What else? Uh, so I thought someone might ask what DSLR should they get if they're going to buy a DSLR for astrophotography? Um, and I think Canon are the commonest. Um, so there's lots of support and help from other people online with Canon. So, and I think Canon are, are just intuitive to use. Um, so I would always recommend a Canon. Um, the ones with the flip out screen are very handy um, because if the camera is on the telescope pointing high in the sky, uh, you need to get on your knees to look at the, the LCD. But if you have one of the ones with a flip out screen, then you can flip that screen out and put it in any orientation you want to, to look at it. And that's very handy. Uh, and looking online, the, the modern ones with flip out screens um, also seem to have Wi-Fi and uh, touch screen as well, which is another um, impressive feature. And it looks like the 70D is the cheapest one with a flip out screen. Uh, and that, but unfortunately that is still about 400 pounds. Um, and they go up from there um, as, the, as the features on the cameras improve and the sensors mm. either get bigger or there are more pixels. Would be worth looking on somewhere like Astro by South. Yeah. Um, you'd probably be able to pick up a modified camera as well, then, one that's had the infrared filter removed. So you'd yeah. be able to uh, image more in, um, deep red light. Yeah. Uh, and it would probably have a low um, mirror count as well, that's been used for astrophotography. Yeah. How are we doing for questions? Um, I think we've I think we've frazzled everyone. Um, Is there anything people want to know for the next one? That's a, yeah, that's a good idea. If 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 there's any um, topics or things you want covering for future. Um, do let us know. Oh, the Astro Buy Sell uh, is the website that uh, yeah. is like eBay for uh, secondhand astronomy gear. Richard, can you get a screen of that up? Yep. Um, make sure you go to the Astro Buy Sell UK because I think by default you go to the Canadian one mm. and you get excited. Um, and then realize it's the wrong side of the world. Um, I was going to say something then and it's gone. Oh, so the, yeah, that's, that's Astro by Cell um, UK. If you click browse ads at the top, Richard. There you go. Well, there's one second from the top. Look, it's, uh... Kind of looks two, two down. There's a Astro modified camera for sale, 250 quid. <laughs> so click Not browse it. ads, Richard, and then show all adverts. 
and there'll be some yellow ones at the top. Skip over those. Canon 600D, oh, that's same as mine. Yeah. Astro mod. Oh, wanted. Yeah. So. And you can search this uh, or post wanted ads. You have to register now, but it's all free. Um, eyepieces. Oh, I'll be there later. Um, so the Plum Tree meeting for July. Uh, Dan Brown from Nottingham Trent University has kindly allowed us to use a recording of his, of um, Alan Heath talking about a lifetime of observation, which we, um, was that a year ago, Richard? At least, yeah, probably a bit longer than that. Huh? Um, which Alan gave at Nottingham Trent University and Dan recorded. Um, and so we'll play that. And we're hoping to get Alan on the phone at the end of the, um, the meeting so he can answer any questions that you guys type online. Right. Uh, one more question from uh, Rob Bush. Yeah. Um, producing images uh, as fits format. Uh, do I need to convert these? Um, that'll depend on entirely on what you are using to process them with. Uh, some packages or process fits straight out of the box. Some you'll need to convert them to a TIFF. Um, yeah, depend. I don't know what software that you're thinking of using to uh, do your stacking and whatnot. Uh, you can stack. Um, Deep Sky Stacker will stack fits, no problem. And uh, if you're then going to do some post-processing, uh, you could output them as another fit uh, format or, or as a TIFF, uh, depending on what software you're using. And if your software doesn't open uh, FITS files? There's always FITS Liberator you can download. I think that's from, is that one of NASA's websites? It's yeah, I'll look for FITS Liberator. And uh, that will convert to uh, FITS format to TIFF. Uh, that will retain all of the um, image data, but you'll just lose some of the acquisition data. Um, so Stuart said, uh, I imagine some members would be interested in a talk on image processing. Yes, so um, at the start of the talk, I, I mentioned we're hoping to do some more of these, one on planetary and one on deep sky. And in each of those, we would... Um, cover data acquisition and processing. Um, so that is the plan. I'm not sure when. Um, unfortunately, we all have full time jobs as well as um, recording these meetings, but it is our plan. Um, we didn't say much about called CCDs, Lee. You're the expert on those. Mm. Um, what do you perceive as the advantage these days still of, of that camera? Of a CCD or, or of a cooled or, or both? Both. Um, cooled cameras, the CMOS or uh, CCD, uh, will lower the thermal noise in the camera. Um, if you're taking astrophotos in, in the summer, you'll, you'll notice certainly that there's a lot more noise in the images, especially with longer exposures. Um, with a cooled camera, uh, the, the modern the ones built in the last couple of years uh, are very good at uh, chilling the sensor, uh, way below zero. I think um, uh, Attic's uh, current cameras can go 45 degrees below ambient. So uh, even you know on a, in, on a summer's evening, you could be chilling the, the, the chip down to minus 25, which will give you a very uh, noise, uh, uh, very high noise reduction, yeah, very noise free image. Um, CMOS versus CCD. Um, CMOS chips have caught up a lot in the last couple of years. Um, a lot of it driven by mobile phone technology. Um, 
because of the drive to produce, to mass produce uh, very small, uh, quick CMOS, uh, high quality CMOS chips. They, uh, they've improved a massive amount uh, where there's not been as much uh, emphasis on, on the CCD chips. Uh, many of those are being retired now. Um, so a lot of the times a CMOS chip can uh, outperform uh, some CCDs. Uh, however, the CCDs still win if you're doing very long uh, exposures. So if you're doing something like um, a 30 minute exposure through a hydrogen alpha filter, for, for example, uh, a CCD will still have a, a lower noise threat, uh, reading when you get the image. Um, and I read somewhere though that the last company to make CCDs are going to cease making them. Yeah, they're, all, they're basically being retired. There's, there's no um, massive uh, drive for them anymore. Uh, I think one of the one of the last things that they were being uh, used for in mass production was uh, CCTV cameras. But again, CMOS technology has caught up mm. there as well, uh, and is very good in low light. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, that technology has been sort of uh, the CCD technology has been wound down. And do you know what sensors they use on things like the James Webb? That'll be a CCD. Uh, I'm sure there's. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure they can build um, custom chips right. for that. Yeah, I imagine they've got the budget to uh, acquire that kind of uh, te technology. And do you think they actively call, I'm asking you naughty questions here, I'm sorry. Do you think they actively call those sensors? Um, I would imagine they try and keep them at a fixed temperature, yeah. Right. Um, they wouldn't want temperatures to fluctuate so that they've got a, uh, keep them calibrated. Yeah. Uh, and Fred say, Fred, don't satellites still need CCDs? Yeah. Um, yeah, again, because they're using very long exposures. So, yeah, CCDs will still be required there. Um, but as, to, you know, as for the mass, uh, mass production of them, I, right. I honestly think that'll cease soon. Um, Attic, who are a big um, seller of uh, astrophotography cameras are uh, producing their last run of their large format camera. Mm. Um, and that'll, I think once they've sold out, that'll be, that'll, be, that'll be done and they'll move over to CMOS. Do Attic have any CMOS sensors already? They do, yeah. They've got right. quite a good range now. I think their Horizon range is, okay. all, C, is all CMOS. Um, um, the benefits there is that they're, they're very good at uh, fast frame rates and uh, longer exposures as well. So they're a lot more flexible with this, the CCD. Right. Um, okay. Well, I think we've come to a, a, a natural place to finish this meeting. Um, I didn't click the link for Zoom in case I just get pulled out of this one and vanish. So thanks to Richard and Lee for their contributions and editing skills to get this one going. Um, I'll close and Richard maybe wants to say something about the next meeting. Yes, just a reminder, uh, next meeting on Thursday, the 2nd of July at 8 p.m. Um, we've got uh, Dr. Richard McKim from the BAA, who is the Mars Section Director, and he's gonna talk about Mars in 2020. Um, so the autumn's really favorable apparition of Mars. Um, so it should be good talk to um, give us a few ideas of what we can observe um, this coming autumn. So yeah, thanks very much for watching everyone. Um, do join Julian for his Zoom meeting. Um, the link's on the screen, I'll leave those um, for a couple of minutes. Uh, hope to see you next meeting. Thanks very much. Good night. Thank you.